Welcome to Successful Scales, the show where I talk to world-class professionals on what it takes to scale successful businesses. I dive deep asking questions to people who are running unicorn businesses, to raising funds, to buying businesses, mergers and acquisitions, IP and patent law, what is to manage performance management. I mean, the list goes on. The idea really is how do I create knowledge and learning for you guys listening in and of course myself, getting the floor with people who I, in many cases, would never dream to share a room with. Before we jump into the episode, I've got to give a special thank you to our sponsors. Firstly, over at Global Wide Advisors, a leading digital consumer products investment bank focused on optimizing the sales process. An incredible team, always happy to pick up the phone and educate you or anyone about the sales process and what you should really consider and can obviously help take you to market or even acquire businesses. I ring them for just about everything these days. Us over at Multiply Me, we are the end-to-end executive search and HR function into the Philippines, helping find better talent and onboarding them effectively. And last but not least, Escala, our management consultancy focused on process improvement, where we help build better systems for your business. That's all the ads you're going to get from me, ladies and gentlemen. The rest is all about learning. I hope you really enjoy and get as much out of these sessions as I do sitting face to face with some of the world renowned leaders in their respective fields, asking them the tough questions that they're not often asked. All right, George, welcome to an episode of Successful Scales, my friend, mate. I am so excited to have you sitting here with me today. Uh, you know, we, we were talking a little bit offline, it's telling you I'd had a bit of a shitty day and I cannot tell you the energy that I have felt just pre hitting record. So I, there's no way in hell I could ever deliver or do you any sort of justice in what an incredible, it's not even career, what an incredible life you've led up until this point and how many people uh, you've impacted and how we even got connected was the fact that you authentically, genuinely, when I believe I connected with you on Facebook said, dude, if you're not a real connection, then you know, you can move on. And I was just like, this is my guy. And here we are today. So without further ado, George, I'd love for you to tell your story. Yeah, man, I love it. And um, I'm, I'm stoked to be here, man. I'm honored. And, and thanks for answering the call and sending me a real message back because uh, it's a hard world out there to figure out who's trying to slide into my DMs, be a bot, pitch me some service, or get me to mine some Forex or crypto, even though I'm pretty good there. So it's uh, for the sake of time and not being here for 12 hours, uh, I will summarize my story from the from the after state here so it'll save us the tears and the all of it but no uh, they, i want them all give give us give the I'll, people I'll, what they want so if i give you what you want then we're gonna have a 12 hour episode dedicated to like <laughs> one year chunks of my life and so i'll let you pick <laughs> apart which ones you want to go into so um i kind of i tell people i'm successful because i'm stupid because entrepreneurship wasn't something i chose it was something that was born out of necessity and so I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I had a pretty tumultuous childhood, uh, physically abused, sexually abused, emotionally abused. I was bullied my whole life. My front teeth were knocked out four times. By the time I was 16, my nose was broken three times. And so I basically was homeless on and off from like 11 on. So I started working at 11, got three paper routes, lied about paperwork, got real jobs. And so I basically was just trying to survive. And in any normal situation, I looked at it and I was like, I don't want to be a drug addict. I don't want to end up like my parents. And if I stay here, I'm going to die. And so what should I do? And I was like, oh, I'll join the Marine Corps and run as far away as possible. And so I forged my parents' signature, joined the Marine Corps at 17, and then uh, barely made it through high school. But my teachers knew uh, that I was a good kid. So they passed me. And what's really funny is you fast forward 20 years, they all listen to my podcast, which is mind blowing to me. Um, and uh, I left for the Marine well, Corps. Well, they got you. They helped you. They helped they you did. get here, right? They did. They saved my life, man. I mean, I I give credit. I go talk to the students. I thank them all the time. I email them. They listen to my podcast. Like, I was like, I'm here because of you, uh, because you took a chance. And so I ended up joining the Marine Corps. Um, I ended up doing 13 years of active duty. Um, 2004, as a snot-nosed 20-year-old kid, I got deployed to Somalia. Uh, had a pretty catastrophic injury and almost lost my legs. 
And so I spent 13 months in a wheelchair. Um, they wanted to amputate them. I told them no. I had to reteach myself how to walk and run. And uh, they said I'd never walk again. Well, I was more afraid of going home than I was of staying in. And so I made a full recovery and then I did eight more years of active duty. And then when I ended up in Afghanistan in 2010, um, I got, uh, I got, I, they hit me a few too many times. I got one too many brain injuries. So I had seven concussions in three years, uh, seven traumatic brain injuries. And so the Marine Corps said, Hey, it's been fun, but we're going to medically separate you. And at the time I had gotten really into like fitness and food and I started healing my body, uh, by eating paleo. I was bulimic for about 15 years because of the sexual abuse and then I needed an outlet, so CrossFit became the thing. So I actually went on to tie a world record for the standing box jump in Afghanistan. Um, and then- uh, What's I made, that number? What's that was, number? At the time, it was 58 inches. Um, now it's like 68, 69, but you have to remember, I'm only 5'7". And so it was about nine inches higher than my height. And um, yeah. Yeah, there's videos on Can the you, internet. You, I was going to say, we're putting it in the show notes. That is so wild. all you have to do is Google George Bryant box jump and it pops up all over the place. But uh, but yeah, so what ended up happening was is after that deployment and, and seeing so much death and destruction and losing friends and seeing them get shot in the face and having to to do things a human being should never have to do and then losing my father in the middle of it. Um, even though my childhood was rough, he ended up becoming one of my best friends. It kind of... It kinda, changed some things for me. I didn't want to be an opiate addict anymore. I didn't want to be bulimic. I didn't want to destroy myself. And so I was like, I'm going to teach myself how to cook. And if I don't tell somebody, I'm not going to finish it. So I was like, I'll just document it on the internet. And so this was 2010. So I had to make a fake college email to get a Facebook account. And then I got a Facebook account. And then I would just pick a recipe a day and I would make it for myself. And I would just post on Facebook that like, hey, I made this recipe. Well, Three months, six months later, it went from 10 people to 200 people. And then someone's like, you should start a blog. And I'm like, what's a blog? And they're like, go to blogger.com. And so I went to blogger.com and I picked the best business name and URL you could ever imagine. You ready for this one? Civilizedcavemancookingcreations.com. It was like How easy, it just, rolls, it just rolls off the tongue. Oh, it was, it was so good. And, uh, and so I kind of, by accident, became a food blogger. And then the Marine Corps about six months later said, Hey, uh, your board's done. We're medically retiring you. You don't get any benefits, but it's been fun. It's been a good 13 years. Good luck. And I had about four months until that was coming. And so all I did was I would work from 4 a.m. until about 8 p.m. every day as a Marine. And then I would come home. I would make a recipe, photograph it, and write a blog post. And I would post it every single night. And then I'd post on social. And I made a rule that if somebody commented or somebody emailed me, it was my fiduciary responsibility to respond because that's why I was putting out into the world. And sure as shit, fast forward seven months, I get out of the Marine Corps and someone's like, hey man, um, you, should, you should save all these recipes in an ebook. That's kind of hard on the website. I'm like, cool. So I literally made an ebook, didn't know what that was, and I emailed it to them for free. And they're like, why did you send it to me? And I'm like, because you asked me to. And they're like, no, 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 we wanted to pay you. I'm like, why would you pay me? They're all on my website. And they're like, yeah, but it's conveniently in one place. And so then they were like, you should upload this to a website called ClickBank. And I'm like, and then do what? And they're like, charge $37. And I was like, okay, cool. And at the time, I had just been blogging every day for free, never doing anything. And so I put it up on ClickBank, $37, did one blog post and sent an email out to 240 people that were on my MailChimp account. And uh, I made 48 grand the first day, 70 grand the second day, and about 110 grand the third day. And my first ever digital product made about a million bucks. And, uh, and then I was like, oh, I guess I'm gonna be an entrepreneur. And uh, I knew nothing. And so the way that I built that business was, I stayed as connected to my customers as possible. When they shared a problem, I created a solution. And that's how I learned and that's how I went. And if you fast forward a couple years, I then turned that ebook into an app. That app got featured by Apple's The Top Health App of 2015. I wrote a cookbook, uh, did the marketing design and strategy myself, and organically with only combined Instagram, Facebook, and email, 18,000 people sold 175,000 copies without an ad, became a 22-week New York Times bestseller, and then 
realized that I really didn't like cooking and I hadn't done any work on my demons, my PTSD, my childhood trauma. And so I drove the business into the ground, losing about 60, 70 grand a month, went to the jungle, drank some jungle juice, sat in silence for seven days and realized that I couldn't keep that company. And so I came home, I called a friend and I gave him a seven figure Christmas present for free. And in 24 hours, I transferred the corporation, the bank accounts and the entire company and I walked away. I deleted social media, deleted my email, changed my phone number, and I disappeared off the internet for three years. And in that process, a lot of my friends and connections that I had made were like, George, how the hell did you get a million Facebook fans when Facebook's broken? How did you get a pin repinned a billion times on Pinterest? How, 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 how? And they all just started calling me for the how. And so I just started going behind the scenes and helping my friends change their business from the inside out by focusing on rule number one, which is I had a fiduciary responsibility to the customer. If they gave me their attention, it was my job to nurture it. And so I started going behind the scenes of all my friends' businesses and I would double them in a week or a month or I'd add $3 million to their bottom line or I'd get their webinar conversions up to 60, 70%. And they're like, how are you doing this? And I was like, cause it's not strategies and tactics. It's humanity, it's people, it's understanding. And so three years behind the scenes and everybody called, everybody, Men's Health, Titleist, TaylorMade, Onnit, Vital Proteins, LA Clippers, sports teams, actors, things I can't say because of contract. And I became kind of the hidden ace in everybody's pocket that nobody knew about. And so I spent three years uh, over 500 companies consulting on the road, uh, helping them ethically build and scale their business. And then my wife was like, hey babe, I love you. Um, you're talking a little too much again. You're healed. I really think you need to get back on the internet because I can't hear this anymore. You need an outlet. <laughs> and, uh, and I decided to go give back. And I was like, what was my biggest challenge as a young entrepreneur? And I was like, well, everybody said they'd help me and they always had a dollar sign attached to it and then all of their stuff was outdated and they were selling it to me because they weren't doing it anymore to monetize them trying to learn something new. And I was like, okay, cool. Well, I'll just turn myself into the Robin Hood of marketing. These companies are paying me six figures to use their ad budget, like $20 million a month I'd spend on ads in one company. And then I'm learning everything that's working and not working. And so then I turned around and started teaching it on the internet for free. And I was like, they don't care because they're making their money and they're paying for me to teach you these lessons and I believe in people, I believe in entrepreneurs. And so that's kind of where I came back on the internet. I trademarked the phrase relationships beat algorithms, launched a podcast, do events, do coaching, do consulting, do masterminds. And I spend every ounce of my day empowering entrepreneurs to deepen their love affair with their customers and using the power of relationships to ethically build and scale to have their impact to make revenue by prioritizing their customers' results first. And that's how I got here. <sighs> Dude, if that is the, I mean, if that's the short version, I, how do I just book you in for a full day and hearing it all? I mean, dude, we, that we'd have just... to, we'd have, we'd have to do a full day. It would, it would be like my publisher is in one of my students. I, I, one of my students is a publishing company for two years. He's been begging just to come to the office just to interview me for a week. Cause he knows I won't write another book. I'm not like writing. And so he literally called me the other day. He's like, June 10th, I booked my plane ticket. I'll see you in Montana. I need eight hours and you in quiet. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I'm just going to pull it out of you at this point. Wow, dude, I can't wait to read that book. So wait, what are the books that you, you've written to date? Yeah, so the only one that I traditionally published was a cookbook. It was a paleo cookbook called The Paleo Kitchen. And then um, when the world shut down um, during the pandemic, I got murdered, like murdered. Um, I lost about a half a million dollars a month in monthly recurring revenue in about two weeks. I lost about $2 million of consulting contracts. And then, uh, two of my e-commerce businesses that were doing about 40 grand a day went under in about 30 days and nothing we could have done. So we just paid employees until we ran out of money. And, uh, so I basically got reset again and started and, and I did what I normally do. I was like, what am I going to do? And I was like, I don't know. And I was like, well, I'm going to do what I know to do, which is to help people. So in three days, I wrote a 110 page book called The Thrive Guide, how to build and scale your business in uncertain times. And then I put it up on Amazon and every platform for free. Uh, and then once they made it 99 cents, it's still 99 cents, but it was downloaded probably like 35,000 times. 
and I went case by case study, barbershops, businesses, e-commerce businesses, and I taught every creative idea, every way to deepen relationships, every way to recession proof your business. And so that one went up on Amazon too. But other than that, I'm more of a verbal guy. I just do videos. That's what makes me happy. Dude, I just sit here thinking like, we are not worthy. Um, you are, you're, you're, you're almost like, you're, you're, you're too good to be real. Um, just the, again, like I said to you from the time that I responded on Facebook and I just said, you know, I'm so sorry, just don't check the platform that much. But I was just blown away at like how brutally authentic and real you were as a, as a human and it just, you know, it just screams off the screen uh, sitting here and, you know, I just continue to sort of build this, I don't know if you'd say love affair, but just uh, an appreciation for, for what you are doing for entrepreneurs and really, you know, I, I think that too many people today think so heavily about the dollar signs and, and it, it gets you absolutely nowhere and so it is just such a breath of fresh air to have you know, I'm going to say a like-minded individual where, you know, in, in my team, everyone here is like, it's all about value creation. How do we add value first? Don't worry about dollars. Don't worry about any of that stuff. We're not even a profitable business yet. And it's because I don't really give a shit. I care about how we serve and how we add value. And I believe wholeheartedly in that the byproduct will be success in whatever that means. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I would already say like, I was just at the, I was telling you before, uh, well, I don't know if I actually mentioned to you, but I went to the EOS conference in Orlando last week and I saw Gina Wickman speak, which is like the entrepreneur's entrepreneur. The gift that he's given in that methodology has helped literally so, sold over a million copies. And, uh, you know, I think it's like 10, 15,000 businesses run on EOS. And he looked at like sort of 20 different points in his keynote speech about, you know, does your vision and traction align with the business? Do you have the right accountability? He sort of broke down all these points. And one of the things like, am I doing things with people I love? And when I, he asked you to rate all of them and talk about actions. And that was the thing that I rated highest. I rated that a nine out of 10. And so I know I'm on the right track because I'm doing, you know, almost what I love. And it's about getting focused and maybe we speak about what your coaching looks like at the, at the back end of this. <laughs> but, um, but uh, mate, I just, I, I love it. I love yeah, it so I wanna, much. So I wanna give some edification to something you said and you said, you know, focusing on the transaction of the dollars. You know, I, I've watched this for the last 13 years and people are starting to catch on now. But uh, in my opinion, everybody monetizes the wrong thing and it's impossible to monetize revenue. The only thing you're monetize, monetizing is attention. That's the only thing that we're competing for. And I watch people try to compete on with and with and with but there's a guaranteed way to win and it's only competing on depth because there is no you. You are the secret weapon and our job is to get attention, but once we have it, what do we do with it? And I watch companies piss millions and millions of dollars a month down the drain because all they're doing is getting somebody to raise their hand, but there's nothing that comes after. And so we have to realize that it doesn't matter what ads you're running, what transactions, what your AOV is, what your LTV is, what your ACOS is, what your CPA is, like none of that shit matters. All that matters is that somebody raised their hand and the person that raised their hand was a human. And human beings require three things to make a decision. They need to feel seen, heard, and respected, i.e. safe. And the easiest way to guarantee that you don't win is to get somebody to raise their hand, have a missing, inconsistent, incongruent, or cold experience, which increases the reaction and the reactants in their body, which actually further digs them into where they are and moves them one step further away from you. And so when we start to understand this, it's putting the humanity into it, but it's like uh, the analogy I give, can you imagine if the Apple store only let you come in if you pre-committed to buying a product you'd never touched? No, because less than 10% of yeah. people that come in the store actually buy a product. The rest of them are getting touch points to inform their next decision that is making them feel safe and comfortable to move forward with what it is. And everyone's like, well, yeah. And I was like, well, you wanna know how they're a trillion dollar company because it's about the relationship with the product and the brand, not about the product itself, which is why we all equally bitch about how expensive they are. And then two seconds later, pull out our credit card and buy it anyways. And so it's a perfect, perfect example. And so for me, I hate losing. I hate it, hate it. 
And so <laughs> I designed a world that it's a win-win game. Because at the end of the day, I truly believe that I can only get a result if you get one first. And that's been my ethos since day one. And people like, George, you make it so hard to pay you. And I was like, no, 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 no. I make it very easy to pay me when the time is right because I could take $1,000 today or I could take a million in 12 months. And I'm gonna go with the million. But I need you to make 10 million first so that you feel like that's an equal exchange of value. So if that means six months, 12 months, 18 months of me pouring into your potential and your possibility, then I'm in. But I truly understand that this game and the way that reciprocity works, and you can go about this statistically, woo-woo-ly, human design-wise, psychology-wise, but it all looks the same is no matter what, you always have to make more deposits than you do withdrawals. And so I was like, how can I design my world, my models, my ecosystem, so that the worst thing that happens is when a customer comes into my world, I turn a no to neutral and a neutral to yes, whether they buy from me or not. And that's why I do it this way. And you've nailed it, right? I wanna help and help doesn't mean, like none of us are writing mission statements says, oh, I wanna cure world hunger only if every hungry child gives me their credit card. That's not what we do, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> Nike doesn't say just do it, but only if you pay me X amount of dollars, right? We have to remember that the easiest thing is to be congruent to what we say we want to do, but we have to make sure that our culture and our ethos and our time and our intention and our content and our lead magnets and our ads match that because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what somebody says or what they read, it matters about how they feel. And none of us, and none of us feel good when we feel cold pitches coming, disconnected, here comes seven upsells. Oh, they're gonna cold call me. They're gonna be boom. Like, yes, by brute force, it works, but find me one of those companies that still exists five years later. And you won't. Yeah. And so you have to prioritize the right thing. And so when you're out there in this world of marketing and it's a busy world, your guaranteed win is depth. But when you get somebody to raise their hand or they send you a friend request or they send you a message, the question should be, wow, they raised their hand. What's the one next step that would move them to closer towards their goal with me being the person that got them there, or me being the company that got them there, or me having the product that got them there? Because the faster they win, the longer their relationship will last with you. Amen is all I have to say uh, <laughs> to that. I mean, spot on. Um, wow, you covered so many topics. I mean, even going back to the to the notion around Apple and yeah, it is really expensive. But when you think about the level of detail that has gone into the packaging, the design, the experience from end to end, how it's, it's how the brand makes you feel as a, as a consumer. And, you know, I've been an Apple fanboy. Anyone who knows me will know I'm a massive Apple fanboy and have been since, you know, the year probably 2000. And I'll never ever switch and they've got me for life. And, you know, I'm not going to look at that price tag because I know, you know, well, I, I'm committed to the, to the operating system. So there's that, there's that little conundrum. <laughs> but, That's but, called um, endowment. And I teach about yeah. that as well. That's a, actually a beautiful point. But, 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 um, but it's, it's absolutely that, you know, I feel, I, I feel great about the brand and, you know, and what it is able to achieve. And, you know, so Taking taking a step back or, or sidestepping for a second, I mean, mate, you're you're so incredibly talented and humble of what you've both been through. I took down a bunch of notes, but you know, I'm just sort of shooting from the hip here now. Uh, um, it's amazing, firstly, to see your journey and how you've transitioned from you know what is one of the more challenging upbringings I can honestly say I've ever heard, and how you overtly and openly disclose that and lean into it and mm -hmm. have, you know, it just builds to that level of connection. You know, that's not the reality that I grew up with, but, you know, I feel like I have a deep sense of who you are and just how uh, meaningful and intentional you are about the relationships that you build. You know, you told me that before you will literally send, you said 240 video um, messages, videos, yeah. messages to people. A day. And, you know, a day. And I have never heard of anyone going to that level of, you know, uh, detail in, in actually having authenticity and connection and commitment to, you know, his, his fellow man or woman. It's, uh, 
it's amazing and it just goes to show you know what you're able to achieve on the back of it so again i've sort of taken a few things here but um i think one of the things that i've noticed about you in talking about your story is is your consistency and your commitment to that consistency you know from from leaving the marines to well still being in the marines and Mm -hmm. one you know one recipe a day one recipe a day i'm really curious to ask how much do you feel like your time in the Marine Corps impacted your journey into entrepreneurship? Yeah, that's such a good question. So it took me about 10 years after getting out, which is about now, to realize the benefits and the value once the trauma wounds were removed, right? Because it's a very disconnected organization where the more pain and trauma we have, the better killers we are. And it's rewarded for being disconnected. And so, um, you know, there is a level of structure and discipline that was given to me Uh, that's very unhealthy, right? I would call it toxic, but the same reason I'm able to share my story so openly is because my story is not who I am. It's just a tool in a toolbox. And what I learned in the Marine Corps is not who I am. It was just a different frame or range of how something can be done. And so for me, somebody who struggled with addiction a lot of my life because of injuries and them getting me to become an opiate addict, it's, it's a crazy, crazy experience. But the one thing that I realized, and and, and I'll say this because it serves merit to the conversation, is when I attempted to take my life um, and I didn't succeed, there was a very dark period after that where I realized I didn't want to die, but by not living, I was choosing to slowly die every single day. And I remember like things felt impossible. It felt impossible to get out of bed. It felt impossible to like even drink water. And I just remember, I was like, as long as I do one thing today, just one thing, and that one thing might be brush my teeth, that one thing might be write in a journal, that one thing might be watch a movie intentionally rather than numbing, like, and it was always just this one thing. And when I take away, you know, from the military and what I saw is that the things that I saw grown men do together when all the odds were against us, like 16 people versus 500, but yet we win and we make it out and everybody makes it out is the one thing that I always remember is that every day was a requirement and not a choice. And you had to put it in and you had to do it and you had to step forward and you had to keep moving. And I've taken that ethos from a healthy place of like just you and I, actually what's funny is when I emailed you back, I stopped and then meditated and then jumped on Zoom and you were meditating at the same time and I was setting my intention for like who I want to be today and what do I want to say yeah. on this call and like what am I going to bring? And I have a commitment to a daily practice. And for me, the reason it's so powerful and important is that it holds me to my potential self, not my current self. And it removes the feelings, powerful. it removes the reactants and it allows me to stay in momentum. And so I think the number, the number one thing that I realized from the Marine Corps is that we were given old technology and basically things that were impossible. But when we committed to it, there was no other option except success. And so it wasn't a matter of if, it was just a matter of when. And the only thing required was just consistent inputs. And some days I could give 100 and other days I could give two. But it's like consistency and congruency over a big span of time changes the world, not intensity in a small window and then falling off when we're done. And so for me, I think the biggest things that I learned is that team is everything. I am nothing without the people around me, nothing. I am useless. I completely have no impact, no voice, no message without my team because the only reason I can send 200 video messages a day is because my team is supporting the back end so that I can be in my power and I can be in my gift, which is humanity. And so team being number one. Number two, I think people truly undervalue consistency and they measure in too small of windows. And so a good example is like when we were deployed to Afghanistan for seven months, we would start doing the workups 18 months prior. That means every day for 18 months, we were drilling what we were doing in country. And so we would practice for 18 months to play for seven. Yeah. And I think that there's this unhealthy relationship that entrepreneurs have with instant gratification that actually becomes a subconscious form of self-sabotage without realizing that that's the actual thing that's cannibalizing your potential results. Because consistency and intention over extended periods of time are guaranteed to move the needle forward. And so can I ask, yeah, go ahead. 
can I ask on that point, and I want to go back to, to that harder point that you talked about in a second. It's, you know, I said to you at the start of the call, I don't know if we'd hit record yet, you know, I was having a really terrible day. It's been, it's been quite rough for me. And, you know, I, I realize now, you know, not to get too woo-woo, but like we were meant to have a conversation today. Uh, we were meant to have a conversation today. But when you talk about instant gratification for entrepreneurs, what is your definition of instant gratification? Yeah, I love that. Um, it's thinking that every time you put an input out into the world that you're going to get something back. Because anything you're doing today, you shouldn't feel for 90 days. And it's only the protection of the input that's going to get it. Matthew McConaughey talks about this a ton in his book, Green Lights. It's like the number one thing he teaches his kids. And, uh, you know, I've talked to, I've talked to him before. Uh, we've had an incredible conversation and it, it's really a beautiful ethos. And what I actually love to give actors and athletes and Olympians credit for is that what they have to love and respect over everything is the process because all we can control as a human being is our inputs, right? The outputs are not up to us. The outputs are an equal sign based on our inputs and our consistency over an extended period of time and making sure we're staying focused on the things that matter. And so for me, one of my clients and one of my teachers, he's responsible for 74 gold medals in the Olympics. He's an Olympian himself. He coaches Tiger and Lance and all of them. And he's one of my clients and one of my teachers. And I've asked him some really incredible questions. And I said, why? Why do Olympians lose? And he said, because they think they're in a race and they're not running their own. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, when you're on the starting line, there's only one game you have. And it's you and your input. If you think about your competitor, if you look at the finish line, if you look left and right, you just lost the race. And all you can do is control your inputs. And so for me, I watch entrepreneurs get wrapped up in like, oh, my Instagram post, my Facebook post, my TikTok, my ads. I'm like, who fucking cares? Because all you're doing right now is actually making it true. Because instead of being like, oh, hey, it didn't work. Let me go make another one. We're ruminating on that fact that it didn't work on some false concept of measure that has nothing to do with us. And then it's derailing every potential energetic input that we can give to the world. And then the next ones aren't going to work either. And so for me, it's like, I don't give a shit how many downloads I get, how many likes I get, how many comments I get, because only one person was supposed to see it. And then the next one, 380 were. But what I'm going to protect over everything is making sure that I flex that muscle every day, making sure that I drink my water every day, making sure I meditate every single day, making sure that every day I have at least one thing to share with the world. And once it's shared, everything on top of it's a bonus. And that's the game. The book I'd recommend is Atomic Habits by James Clear. Yep. One of the most incredible books and a secret weapon for entrepreneur. But we have to realize success is guaranteed. It's fucking guaranteed. But most people don't give themselves a big enough attribution window to allow success to occur because success only comes through iterating and you can only iterate if you practice and you can't practice if you're hung up on your last post and then you don't do another one because I, and here's another Apple analogy and you're a fanboy. So I'm like, cool. Hey guys, you just want a brand new iPhone. And they're like, awesome. And I was like, cool. Which one do you want? The iPhone one or the 13 pro max? And not one person chooses the one. And they're like, well, yeah. And I was like, yeah, but the 13 Pro Max wouldn't exist if the one didn't start. Yep. And we broke it and it got worse and then they fixed it and they broke it and it got worse and they fixed it and they broke it and they got worse and they fixed it. And so for me, I think entrepreneurs need to remove the veil of illusion and think that Apple's successful because they did it perfectly. Apple's successful because they failed more than you. That's it. And so... Everything that we do in the world is feedback. Every single post, every video, every podcast, and boom. And if there is a personal codependent relationship on it, failure is inevitable. Yep. The only time we win is when we look at, oh, I did it today. What worked? What didn't work? What am I going to do differently? And the secret formula, right? Like the one funnel away. Yeah. No, 99 failures for the one that worked is what it should be called. Right, like you're 99 failures away from one that works is really accurately how would you describe that, that tagline. And so for me, I use my unit of measure, my student's unit of measure, not based on their results, only based on their daily inputs. And so I'm like, hey, I, I, I teach this concept. One of my models is called the wedge of expectations, right? 
and entrepreneurships living this instant gratification world, they're like, okay, I'm gonna work out for two hours today, I'm gonna write 17 blog posts, and I'm gonna record three podcasts. I'm like, awesome. And then I asked them my favorite question ever, and I was like, and, and it's sad, everybody forgive me, but it works. And I was like, do you have a dog? They're like, yeah, I'm like, all right, cool. If you walked out of the house and your dog got run over by a car today and died, and you're like, yeah, I'm like, what's the bare minimum you could get done? Knowing that that happened. And they're like, nothing. nothing. I'm like, no, 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 because you're not dying. You have a legacy that you're building. You have children. You have a husband. You have necessities. You have needs. I was like, are you going to feed your children? They're like, yes. I was like, cool. Are you going to pick them up from school? Like, yes. I'm like, cool. Are you going to eat? They're like, oh, I'm like, could you eat? They're like, yeah. I'm like, awesome. I was like, would it help you to go for a walk? They're like, yeah. I'm like, awesome. Would it be okay to send a message to your team? They're like, yeah. And I was like, cool. So I make them build me a floor because everybody lives in the ceiling and nobody thinks about the floor. And I was like, I want to know what the floor is. And I teach it as the wedge of expectations because consistency of inputs over any great period of time is a guaranteed successful result. And here's the beautiful part. That is the actual only way to get a hockey stick or an overnight success Yep, is to be in that relationship. And so for me, it's so imperative. And like, for me, like, why am I humble? Because I don't have shit figured out. I don't even feel qualified to be on this podcast. Like <laughs> that's normal. And it's like, yeah, on paper, right? Like I have equity here. I own that company. I do all of that. And I was like, but I'm still a dad. I'm still a husband. I still cried all day yesterday. I had some really horrible news. It rocked me. And I had to go to my floor and say, what's the minimum that I can get done today? And I put it in a practice. But I look at my life. I look at my business. I look at entrepreneurship that every night when I go to bed, it's all gone. And I was like, cool, I woke up this morning. How do I earn my wife today? How do I earn my kids today? How do I earn my team today? And how do I earn my friends today? And that's how I look at every single day. And that means like every day there is no winning. There is no finish line. There is no trophy. It's if I want something that day, it's entirely up to what I put into it. And that's kind of how I see it. Dude, you might just be the greatest human uh, ever, uh, ever, <laughs> period. Um, wow, 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 Not, qual wow. not I mean, qualified. I will receive that and I will say thank you, even though I would challenge, I could probably put 100 people off the top of my head in a different position than me. Yeah, well, well, I'll say, I'll say, you know, uh, you, you resonate with me on a level deeper than, than almost most and, you know, despite your... Uh, lack of qualifications to be on this podcast, I'd say that this is probably the, my favorite podcast that I've ever recorded. Mm, thanks, and, and, and I would say that because, you know, when I was listening to your focus on inputs, you know, I made a very conscious decision many years ago. It was the first book that ever got me into, I don't know about entrepreneurship. I only, it's funny, on the last podcast, probably the first time I ever called myself an entrepreneur. I didn't even feel comfortable totally. uttering those uttering those words, you know, it, 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 that in itself it was hard enough. But um, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey, yep. you know, I, the, the, I mean, the, a lot, the whole book resonated with me, but, you know, sphere of concern, sphere of, con, you know, sphere of impact and sphere of uh, impact, uh, influence and concern. Those are the three spheres. We got there. And, what I made a decision, like, I don't read politics, you know, I can't influence it. I'm one vote wherever I'm in the world. Right now I live in Israel. I'm just one vote. I'll ask the three people that resonate with me deepest just before election day, who are you voting for and why? There we go. That's done. Why would I invest that much time? And so to your point, you know, it's all about the inputs day in, day out. Who do I want to be? Who do I want to be today? I don't know. I mean, you strike me as someone who might journal. Um, I'm sitting here with I do. my- I, I type my journal. I type it so, because I'm faster, but yes, I use that as well. So I use the, the seven minute journal. You know, my routine is meditate into the seven minute journal. And you know, my daily affirmation today was, you know, I'm not my emotions. They come and they go and I, it's how I respond to them that dictates the outcome. And can, can I give you a hack? Yeah. That will blow your mind. So you write that affirmation in your gratitude journal, right? In your five minute journal, you have those. Yep. Okay. Yep. For somebody who like lived his life, basically a victim to meds and trauma and wouldn't leave the house. Like there was a point, like I couldn't leave my house for three years. Cause if I heard a balloon pop, I would have 
literally spatial flashbacks and be uncontrollable with anger and outrage. Like it was, it was bad. Wow. Um, the brain, right. And I only know the brain from having to heal concussions and you know, like Jim quick, one of my dear friends helped me a ton, um, back in the day. He's, he's unbelievable. Oh yeah. I actually, um, Jim, Jim is a really good friend. It was 2 AM in his apartment when I launched this podcast with him. Um, wow. And so, yeah, I was, I was in there. I for listened to it. that podcast. Yeah. And so, um, one of the things is, is like with our brains, um, our subconscious recognizes our voice over everything. Right. And the only way that I was able to heal, I'm a verbal processor. I like to talk and I like to think, and, and it, it's the speed at which I can do it. And writing slows me down. Um, take your affirmations when you write them, right? Do you do it in the morning or at the night? I do. So in the five minute journal, it's uh, yeah, yeah, three the things. First section, the affirmations in the morning for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So when you write it, I want you to open your phone and I want you to record a video of you reading it to yourself. And then throughout the day, I want you to listen to it at least three times because your voice automatically bypasses your conscious mind because of familiarity and speaks to your subconscious. And so when you can utilize your own voice, and you do it, you're basically programming your supercomputer. And so when I have my students do this, when they're like having their gratitude practices or their affirmations or their power statements, I make them record it in their voice yeah. and either audio or video. And so when I do mine, one of the reasons I do so many videos is because the more I get to listen to myself, say the positive things that I say and hear the positive things that I hear and speak like I speak, it creates this embodiment for me. And so I do this all the time. Like I literally have audios in my phone of like, you're beautiful, you're a rock star, you're an incredible husband. Like, even if you're feeling this, that's not who you are. That's just yep. a check engine light. Like, and I haven't. And so for people listening to this, I, I feel like, and, and, and I want to say this, I'm going to tie a loop together that I opened in my brain when you asked a question. We we're talking about this a minute ago. We we're talking about inputs and instant gratification, right? I think what's important for entrepreneurs to listen is why do we do that? And I think that this has took me a long time to figure it out. And why we do that is because we're allowing the world to dictate our value based on the response that we get. But our value is not predicated on the response that we get, it's on the input that we create. And entrepreneurship is literally one of the world's largest epidemics of addiction. It is one of the most toxic addictions that exist because everything is hustle more, make more money. You're only good at this. How many followers you have? Boom, 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 boom. And entrepreneurship without constraint or without intention can very easily lead to addiction because it's never ending. There's always an email, always a phone, always an ad, always everything. And then it quickly consumes our identity to where now we don't know who we are without the business. And so what I tell people is nobody has a marketing problem. Everybody has a relationship problem with themselves, mm -hmm. their team, and their customers informed in that order. But if you're not careful, entrepreneurship allows you to remove yourself from the one relationship that you're guaranteed to have for the rest of your life, which is you. And so in my methodology and my models and what I teach, we have to realize that our alignment for ourselves, like our mind, our body, and our soul is actually what transfers the energy into everything that we teach, into our words, into our ecosystem, into our videos, into everything. And most entrepreneurs fail and struggle and always get stuck at the same level because they're speaking from a place that they don't really want to be in that's out of alignment. So it's always at the 100 grand ceiling or the 300 grand ceiling or the 500 grand ceiling. And even if they make more, it settles back down. And even if they start again, it only gets to that level. And it's because truly the only input that we need to be pouring into every day is ourselves. It's ourselves. And then from that, everything trickles out into the world. And so the gratitude practices, the, the walking, the meditation, the mindset, the embodiment, the, the affirmations, the who do I want to be, like what do I want to do? But I think it's important to hear because most people that hear me speak, they all have big missions. They're like, I want to change the world. And I believe that to be true. And I know that to be true. But it also requires all of you coming to the table and being okay with all of you and just giving your best every single day. And so I challenge people all the time about what they're doing with their business. Cause you hear it like, Oh, I did that. I'm like, I don't give a shit. I'm like, I took a shit yesterday. Does that mean I'm a shitty person? No, <laughs> Wipe my ass, pulled my pants up. And then I went back to work, right? Like it's there. It's just a moment in time. And I really feel like one of the biggest gifts that an entrepreneur can be given is the ability to plug back into themselves because yep. they are the secret weapon. Like you are the secret weapon. You and I have access to the same books, 
same speakers, same content, same information, same model, same structure, same everything. But the only thing that's different is our unique approach to implementing them. And so we're the DNA that makes us special. And yet it's the number one thing that's neglected. Oh, I need to take a course. I need to consume this. I'm like, how about you stop fucking consuming and just create something? Yeah. Like, how about you put you and your DNA into the world? And so I just think it's really, really important because when somebody calls me and a company's like, I need you to come in and do my customer journey. Dope. I listen to them for four hours and get to current state. And then I start from the top down. And I was like, why are you treating your staff like that? Why does your staff feel unsafe? Because if your staff feels unsafe, then their captions won't work. And if the captions won't work, then the customers won't feel it. And everyone's like, oh, you start with the customer. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I use the customer to get in the door. And then once I'm in the door, I start from the top down. And magically, yeah. magically, when you start to help people with this, the company doubles in a week, but there was no strategy or tactic changed. There was consistency and congruency. There was alignment. There was all of me bringing to the table and allowing that to emerge and to go. And, and yeah, I have models and strategies and tactics and all the mistakes and everything makes. But at the end of the day, no matter what you do, marketing is nothing more than a two-way long-term value-based relationship. Yep. And there is zero relationship that's built in transaction, out of alignment, or with incongruencies. Fantastic. I, I was, I was, I mean, you are just, you're just speaking my language on a level that very few do. And, you know, I hope anyone listening in here really takes in every bit of wisdom that you've shared because it is, it is profound. It is profound things. And again, I said it was really timely and I want to get to the point that I want to ask you. And it's, Please. it's a bit of, oh, a I got nothing but time, man. I got nothing but time. So it's a bit of a touchy subject. I'll, I'll bring it up in a second, but, um, Pat, well, maybe not so touchy, but but you have unique access and insights into a situation that most people don't. And so I'm really curious uh, to gain some of your wisdom and advice. Uh, but I was fortunate enough last week to see, and I'm going to butcher his last name because it's a tough one, but Pat Lincioni, mm -hmm. he, he wrote uh, the, five, uh, the Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Mm -hmm. And he looks at how it all works. I can't recommend him and his practice enough, but he talks about the baseline being the level of trust. And once you have trust in an organization, only then can you have healthy conflict that leads to accountability and accountability that leads into actually driving results. And so everything comes down to that level of security and trust. And, and again, you know, when I'm hearing you speak, I'm just, you know, I'm connecting every bit of wisdom. And like you said, the access that I have and everyone has to all these great, you know, it doesn't cost that much to get a book, um, you know, to buy an audio, you know, an audible book to get a subscription like that and listen to one book a month. You know, it doesn't cost that much. It's even what's it? Not, not scribe. Is it scribe? There's another app. Oh yeah. Scribed is one of them. Uh, I have quite a few of them like lucid chart. You'll like yep. lucid chart because yeah, yeah, it makes yep. it visual. Like it's an Instagram story. That's my jam, man. That's like feeding right into my brain. So, so I mean, just super profound and, and really just, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm vibing everything that you're putting out into the world. And I, I honestly like, you know, I know your students would thank you, you know, all the time, but, uh, you're just, you're doing the Lord's work, mate. You are yeah. guaranteed helping so many people. And I really hope that this podcast helps every single person that tunes in because if you can't take a nugget of value out of anything shared today, then you're probably listening to the wrong podcast. <laughs> yeah, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll share, if you give me time at the end, I'll even share some like hacks and mistakes so that people, people don't make them. But you know, you said something too about like reading. I think this is, this, is, this is key. I think you have to earn the right to consume. That's my belief, right? You have to earn the right to consume because I feel like most people consume from a place of I'm not good enough, something's missing or something's wrong and I'm trying to fill a hole, which is a scarcity mindset versus... I'm going to head in that direction. I'm going to try it. And then when I hit a roadblock, I'm going to find a piece of information or content that just removes that roadblock for me to get back into action. And then it happens again. And then it happens again, because shelf help is not helpful for anybody. You can read all the books in the world, but if they're just stuck in your fucking brain, it doesn't do anything. Yeah. The ideas are great, but it's really the intention and the implementation that makes it different. And I watch people literally further deepen themselves into their stuckness because it increases the amount of options and choices and go. But here's the thing. If you tell me you want to help a hundred people a month 
And I'm like, how are you gonna do it? And you tell me you're gonna read three books. I'm gonna light all three of those fucking books on fire. And I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> you can read those books when you find 25 amazing human beings a day to have a conversation with. And they're gonna ask me how, and I'm like, I don't know. How do you unzip your fly? How do you make your food? How do you date your wife? How do you make your child happy? I have no fucking clue, that's your relationship. But you have to earn the right to be distracted. You have to earn the right to consume. And so it's like, if you wanna go run a marathon, right? You can read all the books you want. Go ahead, I guarantee you. Go sign up for a marathon 12 months from now, buy every running book you can imagine. <laughs> Don't run, and on the day of the race, tell me how you do. Because I guarantee you that if you threw all the books in the trash and all you did was run a mile a day for 60 days, then two miles a day, and then three miles a day, and then eight miles a day, that you have a better chance of finishing, you'll learn how you're supposed to learn, you'll make the adjustments that are needed, and you'll find a book based on your specific running style, your pain points or the shoes that you need, but we need to stop thinking that we can plan this game. This game is not planned. As an entrepreneur, my buddy Alex Sharfin says this best, you're one of the crazy ones. You go out into the future, you see that something needs to be, de needs to be changed, you demand it to be true, and you come back into the present to build it, but yet, you then turn around and you ask people, how do I do it? You're asking somebody else how to build something that only you can build. It's supposed to be dark, it's supposed to be lonely, and you're gonna have to trust yourself because your job is to light the path and you can't do that consuming content. You cannot, you have to be iterating, you have to be creating. I would rather you make a video a day for 30 days than sit there and figure out, what do I wanna talk about? I'm like, I don't know, why don't you start talking and see what comes out? Why don't you see what resonates? Why don't you see what responds? Because I'll find some common themes, but it won't ever happen if for 30 days you read books and you plan and you consume, and then you pick a topic and go, well, I don't know. Of course you don't know. There's no evidence to support it or deny it. And so you have to protect momentum. You have to step every single day in order for something to do. Like, I'm not smart. I'm tenacious as fuck. And I have a five-year-old and a 17-year-old that give me every reason to get out of bed every day. Does it mean this morning I woke up with a unicorn shooting out of my ass and rain? No, my wife's out of town, I'm missing her, I'm about to go on the road for five weeks, I have to film a TV show next week, and I'm like, oh, those are all incredible things, but those things don't fill my heart because I'm not gonna be with my kids. Yeah. And so they're a means to an end for a legacy, but I'm still like, put in the work, put in the work, put in the work. So here's the truth. I'm only allowed to consume 30 minutes of content a week and I've done that for five years, five wow. years. Because I believe entrepreneurs sabotage their own success from consuming and not creating. Because creating is the only way to find your gift, your voice, and your path. And so my only consumption is if I find a pain point and I give myself 30 minutes a week to consume. And everyone's like, well, what do you do with the rest of the time? Create. And somehow in that creation, Everything emerges. I build relationships with Yoni. I end up in Facebook messages. I end up on stages. People DM me. I meet people in real life. I make a video. I get an idea. I do something on a podcast. I write an email. It's just literally honing and honing and honing the muscle to allow the reps required for it to get stronger and then figure out how to use it better. But that never comes from consuming. Yeah, I, I yeah. I get it. I get it. And I agree. And, uh, you know, I'd say you're also, you're very lucky in ways to have sort of found your, I mean, you can you stream out a number of books, but your hedgehog or, you know, from, um, from the book, uh, good to great, you know, the thing that you're best at and that's the content production and you found sort of, uh, you know, call it your calling in life or whatever you want, you know, you're very, uh, aware and conscious about and intent intentional. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you could call it luck or you could call it the $2 million invested in therapy, the 48 plant medicine ceremonies, the three years of bankruptcy. Is that ayahuasca, uh, by the way? Yeah, well, I, I, a lot of them. Ayahuasca was one of them, right? The, the three years of like teetering on bankruptcy, living in a hotel because my wife wanted to leave me, separating five times, being an addict, dealing with all of those things. Like, yeah, I guess you could call it luck or you could call it the choice to keep walking every day because I still don't feel, I still don't feel like I know what I'm supposed to do in the world, but I also feel that the world is telling me what it wants right now. 
And so if I had it my way, bro, I live in Montana. I live at the entrance of Glacier National Park. I'd be sitting on my porch, staring at the lake every day with as many friends as possible, just sitting on the deck with me. But I actually believe in something bigger than me. And I feel like that would be a waste of the energy that I have. And plus, nobody can handle me unless I get this out every day. Like no, no yeah. joke, like no joke. Um, you'll laugh at this, right? I have a competition with all my friends, all my speaker friends, coaches, consultants, like all of them. We, we all laugh with each other. On an average coaching call, I burn 700 calories at my standing desk. <laughs> and so yesterday or the day before, I had like six and a half hours of calls. I burned 4,100 calories at my desk. My average heart rate on a call is 120 beats per minute or up. And everyone's like, why? And I'm like, because if I have more to give, I'm going to give it. Because that's how I measure and play every single day. And so I just think it's really, really, really important because... If you asked me three weeks ago, if I'd be doing this show next week, it would have been a no. If you asked me if I'd keynote that event, I just keynoted the other day, no. Somebody I'd built a relationship with said, hey, something happened, a speaker left, and you were on my heart. Is there any chance you could make it? And I'm like, I'm on my way. Hey, babe, is it good if I go? She's like, yeah, go support. This is what you do. Jumped on a plane, flew to Nashville, boom, keynote, done, home. And so I feel like I show up in a manner that I can answer the calling that I can be open to what's there and that I can, I can pursue it. And, and, and I guarantee you, like this morning, my team and I this morning, out of thin air, bro, thin air, we're like, our branding sucks and I don't like the name of our mastermind. Let's rename it. And I was like, to what? And they're like, boom. And I'm like, cool, go. That's it. Like that was this morning. Like no, no tactics, no strategies, no nothing. I was like, okay. And then I've done that a hundred times. And it's just this constant pursuit of like growth and growth and growth. And I think it really boils down to a choice, man. I really think it boils down to a choice. It, it, it always is a choice. And it's always, like you said, about the inputs. And it's about, I mean, I'd say the thing that I've taken most from the conversation, and there's many things that, you know, re, you know, re, not a reassessment, but um, just the fact that um, it's reestablished a lot of things that I believe to be true. And, you know, I feel more motivated to, lean into my practices, which I do every day. I'm going to absolutely take away and start recording my uh, affirmations. I, it's funny. I haven't read the green book. I'm going to read it. The last guest that I had on brought it up as well. And he talked about the fact that in the book, it talks about how the most profound things that you will ever read are things that you've written yourself. And mm -hmm. so, so I, I mm -hmm. you know, I have to read the green book. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to consume more than 30 minutes of content this week. Don't kill me. Uh, but, oh, it's a, um, hey, it's, hey, it's your choice, man, right? It's, it's your choice. But, you know, in, you, know you, you talked about people, you, you help people scale, right? Here's the thing. There's only two levers that you can pull to scale. There's only two. Nothing else exists. I don't care what you say. I've been doing this for fucking 13 years. One, you're going to say people. Training. Time. Time is one lever. Yep. And then money is the other lever. Right. That's it. They only deduce down to that. There's nothing else. Yes, people, but people don't do you anything if you don't have time to be with those people. Yes, money, but what if you don't have the space to use it, right? It's time and money are the only yep. two levers. What I have realized is that the intentionality and the mastery of time gives you an unfair advantage over everybody else and is the perfect foundation for everything that comes after it. And so, yeah, I look at it and, and I'll give everybody listening. This is the number one question I ask my students. Number one, they do not like this question. Most people don't. And I'm like, hey, what'd you do today? What were you spending your time on? Boom. And I don't care. Like if you want to go, you know, watch YouTube videos or Netflix, like I have all those habits and they're fine, but they're choices. They're not something like I have to do or I have some unhealthy relationship with. And then I'll always find pockets of somewhere between like 30 minutes and six hours of wasted time. And I'm like, amazing. They're like, no, no, no. I was doing research. I'm like, yeah, on Instagram for five hours. Yeah, me too. Right? Like, or YouTube or reading a book. And I was like, cool. So I asked one question. And if they have kids, this is how I say. And I say, hey, Yoni, you have a seven week old son or daughter? Son. Son. You have a seven well, yeah. week old. Yeah. Seven, seven or eight week old son. And I said, awesome. Amazing. Uh, I have one question for you. How much would I have to pay you right now in this moment to convince you to die an hour earlier and never spend it with your child? There is no amount of money. Yeah. But then tell me why in the same vein, we get on tilt and we're supposed to go home at five and we find 75 more reasons to stay in the office. Yeah. 
because the only thing that's happening is dissonance because mm -hmm. we're lying to ourselves due to that lack of relationship with ourselves. Because if we don't put a number on it, the ambiguity is the silent killer of everything we want. And what do all entrepreneurs say? I want more time, I want more money, and I want more freedom. But the moment I give it to you, you run away from it as fast as possible. And that's just simply due to the integrous relationship with yourself and time. Spot on, spot on. So I want to be cognizant of, of your time uh, and, and also my time, you know. I want to listening... answer that question though, whatever that open so, loop yeah, is. So, so I, want, I, want to, I want to do two things. I want, I want to ask you that question and I would love for any additional nuggets of wisdom that you can bestow upon anyone that's listening to us ramble on for the last hour. You know, um, they deserve it. <laughs> they absolutely deserve it. I mean, it's been value filled, but you know, you've, earned, you've earned it. You've earned it. You've, you've exactly. listened to me bump my gums for this long. So I'm either sorry or you're welcome, depending on who's listening. <laughs> absolutely. So I have, um, I have a friend who, who I've become really, really close with over the last year or so. And, um, and this week I woke up to a really hard text that, that his, um, that his daughter had tried to take her life and you know and it's not something that I have uh any experience in and you know the, the thing that I went ahead and did was the only thing that I could think to do you know I've checked in on him every day it was a couple of days ago um I, I sent him I sent him six gratitude five minute journals and you know I, I felt like I understand what impact that has on the positivity and the gratification that I get in, in, in being very intentional about my day and just thought, but I mean, as someone who has, you know, recovered is an even, it's an understatement. As someone who has gone the other stretch and has helped other people live a better life and live a more intentional and purposeful life, what advice could you give me that I could help her and, and him through, you know, what will be, I can only imagine a pretty, challenging road. Yeah, I, I love this question. So thank you for asking. Um, and just to give some more context, uh, I've lost 28 Marines to suicide, 28 wow. so far, and hopefully never another one. Um, but it's, it's, it's a very, very big topic. So, so I'm going to answer this in a roundabout way that will get to the point because it matters. So a lot of people ask me why my branding is a lighthouse, why my branding is a lighthouse. <clears throat> and so when I went to the jungle the first time and sat with mother ayahuasca, and I healed all my trauma, um, a very wise shaman said to me, he said, you'll always be miserable when you have no purpose. And I was like, well, where am I supposed to get purpose? And he's like, wherever you want, it's up to you to decide what your purpose is. And I sat with it for three days and I ended up on a piece of paper, couldn't do anything, couldn't get it out. And I wrote on a piece of paper. One morning I woke up, it came to me. I said, to stand with structure in the face of resistance to create possibility to stand with structure in the face of resistance to create possibility. And that's the purpose that I wrote for my life on a notebook six years ago. And if you think about a lighthouse, by definition, it stands with structure in the face of resistance to create possibility. But nowhere does it say, I jump in the water to try to save everybody so everybody else dies. Because if that light keeper has to turn off the light to get in the water to help that one boat He's not doing his job. And so when I think about our job as entrepreneurs, as humans, as friends, our job is not supposed to control who gets our light. Our job is to shine it consistently and congruently so that they can see it. And when they need it, they ask for help. And so one of my favorite quotes I use for my students is a lighthouse is not interested in who gets its light because giving light is its nature. And so to answer your question for your friend, the number one enemy in this world is isolation. It's feeling alone. And it's going to be non-reciprocated just like most is. But all we need is consistent and congruent touch points with no expectation of return, just so somebody knows that you're there. And so what could that look like? A couple text messages every two weeks of just, hey, thinking about you. If you need anything, I'm here. Like, hey, you were on my heart this morning and I appreciate the woman that you are. Like, hey, and never expecting, never, never probing, never pushing, but increasing the frequency of touch points over an expanded period of time until enough deposits have been made till that person tilts or leans in when needed to feel safe to do so, which happens to be the same ethos that I use in business. 
And so with that being said, our job is not to save anybody. And it's horrible to feel that way, but we can only control what we can control. We can control how we show up. We can control how somebody feels when they're in our ecosystem. And we can constantly be reminding people that we are here and we're not going anywhere. Consistency and congruency. And in that, it speaks more volumes to anything because that person can come in and ask for support whenever needed. And so what you're doing for your friend is already incredible, already. What I would prioritize over everything is frequency over an expanded period of time instead of intensity in a short period of time. So what would be, what would you be, I mean, I'm understanding, you yeah, know, yeah, I yeah. guess, your, your advice to him specifically in how he works with her specifically would well, be so the thing is is that like, uh, every relationship is different i'm not i'm not out to give advice my job is not to give advice i'm not a therapist i'm not anything my job is to be a human and in being a human my job is to let you know that no matter what one click away one text away one call away as a human who understands my job is not to respond my job is to hear my job is to hold space my job is to be a safe space or a vessel or a vehicle and all too often people get wrapped up into my job's to fix it, my job's to fix it, I have to give something. It doesn't matter the situation. When somebody's in a parasympathetic, very, very triggered, extreme situation, all they need is presence. Nothing can be fixed. They need presence because it has to be in their process. And so all I'm saying is that sending gratitude journals is great. Checking in is great, like all of that. But what we need to be is a safe space for them to feel what is their path. Where should they go? What are they trying? And then if they ask for support to give it, because who are we to say like, oh yeah, no, I don't think that therapist is gonna be best. You should try this one. None, none of us are qualified to do that. But we're all qualified to listen, to hear, and then to reflect back, to allow that person to feel safe and confident in the decision that they're going with so that they have a support system behind them. Great, great insight, great advice, uh, really. Uh, I appreciate it. it means a lot to me um, so thank you so to, to, to lighten the mood uh, before we <laughs> before we uh, close close out shop here today and uh, wow I mean like I said to you you know a little bit earlier this was the conversation that I needed to have today and I'm just uh, I feel so grateful that I've had this opportunity to spend this time with you and to sit and you know and, and chat so thank you so much for, for making yeah. the time and for for being here and for being so present um it's been amazing what 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 insights give give us yeah. the good shit give us the yeah, good so, stuff so mate. here's the deal i'll do i'll do this and, and, and i want to practice what i preach this is how i live so for anybody listening to this if you're like oh my god like customer journey boom i will help you you just have to find me the easiest thing to do is send me a dm on instagram if you dm me on instagram you're like george customer journey i will send you a free training no opt-in required no funnel required, like I just wanna send it to you because it will give more context to what's here. If you're like, George, will you show me an example of how you do emails? Ask me, I will give you 100 emails that show you how I do this every day and you can watch them. If you want my podcast, you don't have to subscribe. I don't want you to. Just send me an email and I'll send you my top 10 episodes to make sure that it can support you, right? So if any of that comes up for you, if you have a question, you need clarity, shoot me a DM. My Instagram is it's George Bryant. So I, I wanna lay that out there, but I wanna talk about I've been thinking a lot and I've been keynoting a lot and speaking a lot this year and I keep seeing this and this is the number one mistake that I've watched entrepreneurs make and I'm gonna fix it for you right now. And I did it with Yoni when Yoni added me as a friend and I'm gonna talk about it, right? And so remember when we go back and I'm gonna close this massive Zygarnik loop all the way back to the beginning about monetizing the wrong thing. The greatest gift that you have is when somebody raises their hand for you and says, I'm interested. But the greatest responsibility is that when they raise their hand, it's up to you to invite them in, not for them to step in. And you have to realize that your work starts the moment their hand is raised. And that's where the real work happens. Just getting attention is not the game. It's our job to always have a next step. And so I like to teach with inversion theory because people remember it a little bit more. So what is the number one mistake that entrepreneurs make when it comes to customer journey? I call it the zone of doubt. The zone of doubt. And the zone of doubt is the moment between when somebody raises their hand, opts in or buys something, and the amount of time that takes place before a touch point occurs. And I wrote this really eloquent statement. And since this is recorded and you can rewind it, I want you to write it down, but I'm gonna read it to you. 
The zone of doubt is the space between the opt-in, exchange of information, or purchase where the dopamine is wearing off. The longer that zone exists, the faster the undercurrent of anxiety and doubt takes over your customer's emotions, deteriorating both of your chances of success. And one of the greatest assets that entrepreneurs have that they're afraid to use is time and patience. If you get somebody to raise their hand and I gave you the choice of like, hey, do you want a customer for a month or do you want one for 10 years? You'd choose 10 years. So stop trying to get them to do everything in one day. Your entire job is to build a step-by-step -step ecosystem to where when somebody comes in, they get less than one thing to do a day that builds momentum, stacks habits, and gets them into their results. Change happens over time, not in a moment. And so why do I talk about the zone of doubt? Because, and I'll give you a tangible example. Hey, opt in for my seven day checklist, right? And then the first email is 38,000 words long. And it's like, add me as a friend, whitelist me, download this, do this, do this, do this. And it actually turned a potential customer into a never being a customer again because it increased reactance. So relationships are the secret to everything. And the number one way to use the power of relationships to help customers and to scale your business is to communicate effectively and always manage expectations. And so if your job is to date somebody on your first date, you are not gonna leave that dinner be like, all right, sweetie, I'll meet you at the altar tomorrow at 7 p.m. because it's time to get married. No, 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 no. You'll be like, oh my God, it was so incredible. I'll text you tomorrow just to check in. And then when you text them again and they engage back, what do you do? Oh man, I'd love to make a date for another time. And it's chunked down step by step by step. And so in your world, when there's people subscribing to their podcast, opting in for your content, commenting on your social media, the longer the gap between when they engage with you and when you engage back, the increased likelihood that they will never get a result, never be your customer, and will turn into an anti-marketing machine. And I'll be really fucking direct with you. Um, none of you, none of you have earned the right for somebody to comment on your social. They don't owe you shit. Just because you make a post, just because you have a podcast, nobody owes you a comment or engagement. It's your job to go make that happen. Relationships are two ways, not one way. And so our job is if we're going to put it into the world, if we're going to get people to raise their hand, if we're going to say we're going to do it, means that it's also our responsibility not to get them to comment, to once we share it, to go engage with them, to give a relationship the chance of working. And so nothing is guaranteed. Nobody owes you anything. And if you want it to be done, you're going to have to do it. But you will never be able to build and scale a business on a hollow ground with a lack of depth. And I would rather have a thousand Instagram followers that I go engage with first and in reciprocity, they engage with my content that actually get results and make a difference than a million of them that I have no relationship with that I can't engage with. And then every comment's a fucking emoji because nobody's doing anything except commenting and engaging and doing nothing with it in their life. And so you have to remember that no matter where you are in your business, your first five figures, your first six figures, seven figures, eight figures, it doesn't matter. The depth of the relationship with the human beings that you have is the only guaranteed way to scale. Scale happens through retention and not acquisition. And so if you are not 100% confident that you can have 20 more people over for dinner and feed them all because you're not currently feeding the children you have, stop inviting them in, go deep with the people that you have, and then confidently invite more people in. So do not ever, and I mean ever, allow the zone of doubt to occur. If you're gonna put it out there, it's your job to close it. And it doesn't mean you have to fulfill. It just means you have to tell them what's next. For example, I have consulting clients pay me hundred grand, they pay me 150 grand. And they're like, George, what happens after I wire you the money? I'm like, I'm gonna send you an email. I was like, you're not getting a contract, I'm not doing anything, but you'll have an email in the first hour explaining what's next. And then in that email, I'm like, hey, you're not gonna hear from me for the next eight days because I'm gonna be doing my homework and what's going on. But at eight day mark, I'll shoot you an email and I'll let you know what I found. And it's about clear communication and managing expectations so that a relationship can take its course so that the person feels safe, seen, and heard and has the best chance of executing whatever it is that we give them. And I'll stop there. Dude, I, uh, yeah. I don't, I'm lost for words and that like seldom happens. So, uh, <laughs> bravo. Uh, but in all seriousness, George, mate, um, thank you. 
just thank you so much for your time, for your energy, uh, for getting me out of what was a tough day. You know, my, I was telling you before, my dog stepped on glass and, you know, she's suffering at home and my son's been crying all day and my fiance's stuck with him and I'm excited to get home to them now. And, you know, I'm leaving with an energy that I feel rejuvenated and excited. And, you know, I, like I was saying, you know, you have to win every single day at every relationship that is important to you. And so, you know, that's what I'm going to go ahead and do. And that's the thing I'm going to commit to on the back of this. So yeah, uh, a thousand times. It, thank you. Of course. I love it. Thanks for having me. It was a blast. I'll do it anytime. Man, I would love to have you back on. Thank you so much. 